All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Pat Kane, Public Programs and Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And I want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight as we continue our annual garden speaker series with our second event in this year's virtual speaker series. Um, I want to especially thank tonight's presenters, uh, Bethany Elkington, James Graham, and Bernard Santar Sierra. Uh, for providing our program tonight titled Medicine and Materia Medica in the Illinois Country, Exploring the Medical Flora of the Atkins Garden at the UIC College of Pharmacy. Uh, Bethany, James, and Bernie will join us in just a few short moments. Uh, before we do get into tonight's presentation, I did want to go over a few housekeeping items, uh, let you know what's coming up at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, Champaign County Forest Preserve District, tell you a little bit more about this year's series. So first and foremost, if you haven't done so already, let us know where you're watching from uh, by writing down in the comment section below where you are tuning in from tonight. Uh, I'm coming to you live from my home in Champaign, which is under several inches of snow right now. If you're in central Illinois and the Illinois area, uh, uh, quite a snowy day. So uh, dreaming of warmer gardening days, uh, warmer days, uh, uh, especially in the future. Uh, and tonight's program hopefully will make me feel a little bit warmer. Um, uh, uh, and we have some folks tuning in, letting us know where they're watching from. Sheila's tuning in from Fairfield. Uh, Katie tuning in from Urbana. Hey, Katie. Barb is tuning in from Champaign. And Olga tuning in from Champaign as well. So thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. If you haven't done so already, let us know where you're watching from down in the comments section below. Um, a little bit about us. If you don't know anything about us, uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie. Uh, we opened originally as the Early American Museum in 1968, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. Um, we're part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, which is a collection of seven forest preserves here in East Central Illinois, uh, two educational facilities, including our museum, uh, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center at Homer Lake Forest Preserve, uh, a golf course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, a multi-purpose um, uh, decommissioned railway uh, uh, that is now being used to run, walk, and ride um, uh, from Champaign County to Vermilion County eventually, um, and so much more. So check us out if you're local, Champaign County Forest Preserve District. Also, um, tonight, we would love to hear from you uh, after tonight's presentation. Uh, uh, we're asking uh, that folks complete this short survey that I dropped into the comment section right now. I shouldn't take any more than five-ish minutes or so. Let us know what you thought about tonight's program. And then also, if you'd like to suggest uh, future program topics and things that you'd like for us to do in the future, also feel free to mention that in that survey. Um, coming up uh, in the near future, the next program in the garden speaker series this year actually going to be the third and final uh speaker um in in this year's program is going to happen on wednesday march 30th it will stream live again on our facebook and youtube pages uh, with a program titled everyday uses for medicinal plants and how to grow them uh aaron hassan who's vice president of the champaign urbana herb society uh, will join us to present this program to talk about this great local organization, as well as how to grow medicinal plants yourself, start your own garden um, in ways that you can use them in your everyday life. So again, that program is going to be on Wednesday, March 30th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, on Wednesday, February 23rd, um, we're going to uh, uh, put on a program titled Maple Sugar Days, Remembering uh, John Garvey. Um, we're going to rebroadcast a virtual program that we did last year with longtime volunteer and longtime friend uh, John Garvey. Um, John Garvey uh, passed away last year, um, so we're going to rebroadcast this great program that he helped us put on last year, as well as um, you know not only learn how you can tap your own maple uh, uh, maple trees in your own backyard on your own property. Uh, along with John and us, uh, but we're going to share some memories uh, since it was a, a great hobby of his uh, that he shared with us uh, for such a long time. Um, so that program is going to be on Wednesday, February 23rd, again at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time on our Facebook and YouTube pages. If you're local um, and you want a, an excuse to get outside safely, uh, make sure you uh, travel safely. Uh, we encourage you to go out and find uh, snowflakes as part of the CCFPD snowflake search. We've hidden 40 creatively painted and uniquely uh, created uh, 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 snowflakes throughout Champaign County Forest Preserves. Uh, get out there, see if you can find all 40 of them and share your photos of your finds with us using the hashtag CCFPD snowflake search on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Great way to get outside.
this winter time um, if you're looking for an excuse to get outside this winter. Uh, for more info about all these programs, everything else happening with us at the museum, as well as the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, we encourage you, if you don't already, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Um, also wanted to make you all aware, since we're here for this garden speaker program tonight, about uh, 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 medicinal plants, uh, long-time uses of medicinal plants in this area. Um, we are looking for volunteers because in relation to tonight's program, um, uh, we're going to try to um, uh, uh, put on a, uh, a create, reimagine a space near the museum uh, that will be a medicinal and healing garden project. And we're looking for volunteers. Wanted to put, it, put the word out to you all watching if you're local, um, where um, uh, you can reach out to myself uh, via email or my colleague, Katie Snyder, if you're interested in becoming a volunteer to help us uh, design, plan, coordinate, plant, and maintain um, a new medicinal and healing garden at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve in Muhammad, Illinois. Feel free to reach out to me at pkane at ccfpd.org or my colleague, Katie Snyder at um, ksnyder at ccfpd.org and I'm dropping those emails into our comment section right now if you'd like to reach out to us if you're interested in volunteering as part of that project. Um, also, I uh, wanted to let you know about tonight's program. Uh, before we get into the presentation, uh, I wanted to start by saying that the theme for this year's series was inspired by another project we're working on at our museum. We're currently working to complete a special exhibit set to debut in May of this year. Um, where the working title of the exhibit is A History of Healing, and we'll examine how infectious diseases such as tuberculosis, smallpox, influenza, polio, cholera, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19 have impacted Champaign County and Central Illinois throughout this area's history. Um, the exhibit will also look at outcomes and ways that communities came together during these previous and current epidemics and pandemics. Uh, and to go along with that exhibit, um, uh, came the theme for this year's virtual series as it is dealing with medicinal plants, how humans have used them throughout history, and how to start a medicinal plant garden of your very own. And as I mentioned before, if you're interested in reaching out to us uh, to be a volunteer as part of our new medicinal and healing garden project, feel free to reach out to us via email in those emails that I uh, put below. Because we're hoping that this is going to be a great educational and relaxing space for the community. And I'm interested to learn alongside you all um, from our, our very knowledgeable presenters um, tonight. So now I'm pleased to bring on our presenters for this evening. I'm uh, going to bring on James here. There's James. Uh, bring it on Bernie as well, and Bethany, uh, our presenters uh, for tonight's program. How y'all doing? Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, yep. Beth. Hello. All right. Uh, thank you all so much. I want to extend a big thank you to Bethany, uh, James, and Bernie for joining us tonight to present our program. Um, uh, I will introduce them uh, and then turn the show over to our presenters. Uh, so first, we have Bethany Elkington. Uh, Bethany is a research assistant professor in the UIC College of Pharmacy, um, where her focus is on medical ethnobotany of plants of Southeast Asia, West Africa, and the Chicago area. Uh, she is also a research associate in botany at the Field Museum, which houses the Searle Herbarium. Uh, next, we have James Graham. Uh, James is uh, a research assistant professor in the UIC College of Pharmacy and a research associate in botany at the Field Museum. He is editor of the NAPR Alert uh, database at the UIC, the premier knowledge base on the taxonomy, chemistry, pharmacology, and folkloric use of natural products, and has conducted field research in botany, zoology, and ecology in Peru for over two decades. And James is actually coming to us from Peru tonight. Um, and our third presenter is Bernard Santar Sierra, a research professor at the UIC College of Pharmacy, where he's been since 2000. He's mainly interested in drug discovery with a focus on the use of natural products and advanced techniques development to make drug discovery more efficient, inexpensive, and more successful. So again, I wanna thank the three of you so much for joining us tonight. I know that a lot of work has gone into this presentation. Uh, you all are very knowledgeable individuals, so I'm really looking forward to learning from you all. So let's give a warm virtual welcome out there, all of us watching to our great <laughs> presenters tonight. So with that, I will uh, turn the show over to you all. Um, and it looks like I, we have the presentation pulled up here. So I'll let you all take it away. Okay. Um, yeah, so you already talked about the, the title. So maybe we can start with the next slide. Um, That's what we'll be talking about this evening. 
Um, so this is an outline of the presentation. Um, and I would like to invite you all to visit anytime you're in Chicago. Not so much the winter, I would guess, but it's actually open to the public 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, prairie state epidemics and the history of sort of medical practice over several centuries from the historical period up, up really through today. Um, and and um, we'll frame this medical practice uh, across these centuries. I'll be talking about um, two basically pandemic diseases, uh, cholera and Spanish flu or epidemic influenza and the medicinal plants or vegetable materia medica that were used to treat them. Um, from there, Bethany will talk about several of these selected plant species that were used for cholera and, um, and epidemic influenza uh, with an outline of the botanical and bioactivity profiles. And finally, Bernie will bring us back to the present and looking forward to the future, uh, discussing current research activities in the area of natural product drug discovery using botanical sources. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a little video we made um, when we started doing a virtual garden walk uh, with the pandemic. Um, feel free to visit us. It's probably better between May and September, but this is what the garden looks like in June. Um, it's a nice little space. Um, it's kind of a little calm, uh, an oasis of calm in the middle of the bustling city. And there behind is the College of Pharmacy. Okay, um, let's change the slide, please. Next slide, yeah. So uh, in terms of the taxonomic diversity in the Atkins Garden, there's approximately 150 different plant species, mostly temperate, perennial herbs, shrubs, and trees. Um, a, quite a good collection of native um, American species, but there's, they're mostly from the North Temperate region as well, Europe and Asia. Um, we have dicots, monocots, gymnosperms, and ferns all to be found in the garden. Um, next slide, please. So this is this is Dorothy Bradley Atkins. She is uh, the Atkins Garden was founded by a generous gift from Dr. Robert Atkins, who I believe lives in your area, uh, downstate at Urbana-Champaign area. And he was he donated he made a generous gift in honor of his wife Dorothy, who graduated from the UIC College of Pharmacy in 1945. The garden has three missions to support research at the College of Pharmacy, as well as to support teaching, education, and community outreach. Uh, next slide, please. So as part of the research effort um, associated with our natural products, uh, Pharmacognosy Institute within the College of Pharmacy, it's a very, uh, it's a world-class natural products program, one of a very few in the U.S. today. Um, the plants that you see listed here uh, were the subject of uh, intensive research on botanicals and women's health, part of an NA, a National Institute of Health funded project in botanicals at the College of Pharmacy and studying bioactivity, chemistry, and clinical effectiveness of, um, and these were explored as part of this uh, NIH funded project. And there's a link at the bottom if any of you are at all interested in reading the scientific publications that came out of this research. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so community outreach. Um, we, we have had in the past an annual garden walk event. In the last several years, it's been virtual. And we also have a speaker series. Um, and if uh, you're all welcome, if you're any in the Chicago area to come visit us. Um, we'd like to hopefully resume our annual garden walk events in person, hopefully next year, but we'll have to see what the university tells us. In the meantime, um, at the end of this, at the end of the show, we're going to also give a link to the, um, to the, the virtual garden walk. But there's a lot of videos and a lot more information on the garden itself. Okay. So let's, let's shift gears now. And I'm going to start talking about, um, about the next section of the, of the, um, of the presentation. So um, next slide, please. Right, so here we he find a set of epidemics recorded in Illinois. 
sorted into pandemics, which are global scale outbreaks. Uh, second, we see a broad class of fevers, whether bacterial or parasitic, as well as several other infectious diseases with reported outbreaks throughout Illinois history. These are presented with the common name of a disease, the causative infectious organism, not known at the time in most cases, its residency status, whether it's invasive or endemic to the region, and the time frame of the reported epidemic outbreaks in the Illinois country. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the, well, <laughs> there's a lot of text here. I want to apologize for that. We'll get to some nice images of plants soon. First, to call, the first um, historical records of the region can be found among the vast All right. uh, okay, so uh, I'm having a hard time with this. Um, the first historical records of the region can be found among the vast literature reported by the first Europeans to visit the Illinois country, uh, French Jesuit priests. Oh, goodness, I, I, I don't have my notes for this slide here. Bear with me a second. I had this printed out. Um, uh, okay, yeah, I, I changed the sequence. So here we, here we present the outlines of two global infectious disease pandemics that brought great suffering to the Illinois country. Cholera, which originated in India and which still remains a global health problem, reached North America in 1832. Epidemic influenza, often referred to as the Spanish flu, might in fact have originated in the United States. Its first known outbreak was reported at an army base in Kansas. Cholera infections in the pre-antibiotic era had a mortality rate of above 30%, while epidemic influenza has a mortality rate somewhere less than 10% or so. But both were causes for alarm, no doubt. The current COVID-19 epidemic is similar to epidemic influenza outbreak of 1919 in that it has a similar mortality rate and both can develop into acute respiratory distress syndromes. They differ in that the 1918 epidemic was caused by an H1N1 influenza A virus postulated to be of avian origin, while the COVID virus is of the SARS class and is believed to have originated from bats. Deaths from Spanish flu were mainly from secondary bacterial pneumonia, while COVID deaths result from an overactive immune response, resulting in multiple organ failure. Okay, next slide. Okay, now I'm back on track. I'm sorry for that, folks. So the first historical records of the region can be found among the vast literature recorded by the first Europeans to visit the Illinois country, French Jesuit priests, who were often accompanied by fur trappers. After the Jesuit order was banned by France in 1764, other religious orders took over their activities. This Jesuit literature reveals very little about the uh, medical practices of the various indigenous groups of the Illinois Confederacy, except to mention the common Native American practice of sweating in specially constructed lodges. The shamanic practices of Native medicine men were looked down upon by the priests and missionaries who referred to these practitioners as jugglers. Uh, bloodletting and the use of drastic purgatives were common practice in the medical traditions of the French missions. Accepted medical practices in Europe at this time were heavily re relied on ancient medical theories based around the balancing of humors in the body, as well as the harmful effect of miasmas in the environment that penetrated the body to cause illness and disease. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, French influence in Illinois country was replaced by American dominance beginning from the time of the American Revolution. At this time, regulation of medicine in the young United States still remained virtually absent. In 1800, there were four colleges of medicine in the United States, in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, and Dartmouth, New Hampshire. When Illinois was granted statehood in 1818, no colleges of pharmacy yet existed in the, in the entire United States, but there were now eight American medical colleges, seven on the East Coast, and one west of the Appalachian Mountains, the Transylvania Medical College in Lexington, Kentucky. By the outbreak of the Civil War, Illinois had seven medical colleges, 
and one college of pharmacy. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so the, exp the expansion of medical schools in the 19th century came with the development of various medical sects with, with a variety of systematic approaches to treatment of diseases, as well as of patients. The eclectic system of medicine emerged in the early 19th century and eclectic medical colleges flourished throughout the century, particularly in the Midwest region. The last eclectic, me eclectic medical program, the Eclectic Medical Institute in Cincinnati graduated its last class in 1939. Um, now it's actually the old college is, is, is the, is the Lloyd uh, Library and Museum. If you're ever in Cincinnati, that's, and you're interested in natural products and the history of pharmacy, that's really a, a good place to go visit. Uh, next slide, please. So here is just an example of an early American eclectic medical text, um, showing an illustration of, of the plant, which is, uh, blue cohosh, uh, along with a description of its properties and medical uses. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here are plants that were used uh, by the eclectics for cholera. For tens of thousands of years, humankind has depended on plants for survival, for food, fiber, shelter, and medicine. Across continents and cultures, traditional medical practices often evolved around the use of medicinal plant resources from the local environment. Here we list a number of plant species that were used in the Eclectic Materia Medica to treat cholera. Uh, plant species highlighted in yellow are native to the Illinois region. Uh, plant extracts contain a complex mixture of compounds. In the case of medicinal plants, these extracts represent a polypharmaceutical preparation capable of modulating the complex of etiological factors that manifest in the body as symptoms of a disorder or disease state. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here are several plants used by eclectic physicians to treat cases of epidemic influenza. In terms of their medical potential, the metabolome, which we, which we define as the total number of distinct chemical metabolites present of each plant species, represents the output of what we could consider as tiny enzymatic chemical factories capable of producing a series of characteristic compounds for each of these species. The approximately 450,000 species of plants on Earth, as well as other life forms, particularly bacteria and fungi, are capable of generating an untold chemical diversity of natural products that could escape the imagination of the synthetic chemist forever. So this concludes my section of the talk. Um, now Bethany will, will uh, talk about a few of the plants that we found on these lists um, that are that are we host in our garden that we use for treating cholera and epidemic influenza. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James, um, and thank you, everybody. So one of these plants is echinacea. Um, we have two, we have all three types growing in the Atkins garden. Actually, I just have two pictures here. So we have echinacea angustifolia on the left and echinacea purpurea on the right. So echinacea is a member of the daisy family, Asteraceae. It's native to the United States and um, it's one of the most popular herbs in the U.S. market. So it's used internally to treat upper respiratory tract infections as an immune system stimulant and topically to promote wound healing. Um, both of them, both of these two are often used interchangeably with Echinacea angustifolia is native to the Great Plains from Canada to west, um, west of the Mississippi River to Mexico to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Echinacea purpurea, the other one, this is distributed from Michigan to Louisiana as far as Eastern Oklahoma and as far as Kentucky. So the dried roots, but also the fresh aerial parts are used. Um, reputation of echinacea preparations among eclectic physicians, like James just talked about, was built on widespread use of tinctures 
um, of the specifically Echinacea angustifolia roots. So this could be applied topically for wounds, infections, and poisonous bites and stings, and also administered internally for acute infections. In the early 20th century, the use of echinacea had extended to conventionally trained physicians as well, being listed as an official drug in the national formulary of the United States. Um, clinical research on plant preparations of fresh aerial parts of echinacea established its usefulness in treating the common cold. As in many crude plant remedies, single active compound has not been identified, but this is considered the echinacea polysaccharides, which are only found in echinacea purpurea so far, may be responsible for some of these effects. Um, at UIC, the NAPRALERT database reports 228 unique compounds in 44 different chemical classes for Echinacea angustifolia and for Echinacea purpurea, 364 chemical compounds in 48 compound classes. Um, there are 188 compounds shared between Echinacea purpurea and Echinacea angustifolia. Um, the next plant is nettles. So this is Urtica dioica, also known as stinging nettle. Um, it's got these little trichomes that, that sting people and inject histamine, which can be quite uncomfortable. Um, this is found throughout temperate North America. It's a weedy kind of sprawling plant. It comes up in the early spring and it has rhizomatous roots. It's got these opposite tooth leaves like we see here, and then these tiny green, greenish white flowers here. Um, <clears throat> right, so at the base of these trichomes, which are these little, you can see them in the picture here maybe, um, they have an elongated tube-like structure that's got a bulbous tip that breaks off pretty easily and this secretes a combination of chemicals, including formic acid, which can cause stinging, itching, or mild to severe burning. Um, if the plant is dried and powdered, extracted, or cooked, there is no reaction. The young nettle leaves are edible, nutritious, a good source of calcium, vitamin A, and vitamin C, and other minerals, and one of the highest sources of protein known from wild plants. Clinical studies have shown nettle leaf to be beneficial for reducing joint pain and inflammation. One study finding that people with arthritic pain in their fingers found relief by applying fresh nettle leaf daily for a week. Nettle has been long favored in folk medicine for its role in contracting seasonal allergies and other mild respiratory conditions. And there was a study of 98 test participants taking an infusion of the freed dried leaf for their allergies and they found significant benefits. Um, nettle leaf may be an effective treatment for certain conditions of the prostate, such as benign prostatic hyperplasia. There is more research needed in this area, um, but clinical trials do show that nettle can reduce the size of an enlarged prostate. Okay. I have to get into my notes here. So our next plant, black cohosh here. Um, alternatively, Actea racemosa. It's commonly known as black cohosh here, and it is native to the woodlands of eastern United States and southern Canada. So this is an herbaceous plant in the crow root family, also crow foot family, sorry, Ranunculaceae. Black cohosh produces large compound leaves from an underground rhizome with long racemes of white flowers emerging in the late spring atop a tall stem. So we can see some of those here. Um, flowers mature into multiple dry fruits, each with several seeds. So here are the seeds here. And when shaken, these make a rattling sound and that provides another name, another reason for the common name, which is rattlesnake root. European settlers to North America soon learned from indigenous peace of peoples the use of the crushed fresh flowers used externally worked as an insect repellent, um, as well as its being util in the treatment of gynecological disorders. 
Simisifuga appeared in the U.S. pharmacopoeia under the name black snake root, and throughout the 19th century, it was used in the treatment of snake bite, inflamed lungs, and pain from childbirth. Um, the word cohosh derives from a Penobscot name for the plant, which sounds kind of like kuhas, which roughly translates as with rough roots. So this refers to the similar looking, especially before it flowers or fruits, but it's a different um, species known as blue cohosh that James just mentioned a minute ago. And that one has very rough looking rhizomes um, with the other common name. So since both plants were used by native peoples in, raising, in easing childbirth, cohosh was thus applied erroneously to black cohosh, which actually has a much smoother rhizome. So basic clinical research on black cohosh has been conducted at the UIC College of Pharmacy through the National Institutes of Health-funded Botanical Dietary Supplement Research Center for Women's Health. And this identified more than 120 compounds in the plant. And many of them were elucidated and mechanisms of action sought. Um, and this also went into phase one and phase two clinical trials on safety and efficacy in the treatment of menopausal symptoms um, specifically hot flashes. So at UIC, the NAPR alert database in the College of Pharmacy reports more than 450 unique chemical compounds that have been identified in Simisifuga racemosa to date. All right, and last of all, we have butterfly weed. So this is Asclepius tuberosa. Um, this is also known as pleurisy or butterfly weed. So this is a plant in the milkweed family of Asclepiadaceae. It has these bright orange flowers here, and these produce nectar that attra attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. The plant is native to Eastern and Southwest North America and has been used to treat asthma and bronchitis. The root was either boiled or ground into a powder to be used in reducing inflammation of the lungs and pleural membranes, and this helped to mitigate breathing issues. It was also used in a poultice for bruises, swelling, and rheumatism, as well as being used externally in wound healing. It was also used traditionally as an emetic and purgative. Um, it's important to remember, as in many incompletely investigated plant-based medicines, that potential toxicities are a concern, um, especially as in this case, the root contains a variety of potentially very toxic cardiac glycosides. Um, at UIC, the NAPR alert database that is reporting 147 unique compounds in 24 chemical classes for Asclepius tuberosa. And I do want to just throw out a, um, a word of caution that we are not speaking from a clinical standpoint, and any of the plants that we're talking about, we're not um, endorsing medically. All right, Mayapple is another one. And this is called mayapple because it's, a, it's also an herbaceous plant. And typically around the month of May, it will get this sort of apple-looking fruit that will come in between two leaves. So this is native to the area. It's pretty common in the woods. And this is a source of um, some anti-cancer drugs, notably opodophyllotoxin. Um, and I am going to leave that there so Bernie has time. So we will switch gears and learn a little bit about the research process overview from Bernie. All right, thank you, Jeff. Um, so start up the next slide. Um, what I've outlined here is kind of the whole process. You know, so you've heard that we have um, certain preparations. They may be or the poultice. Um, they may relate to something about the plant, whether or not it's the stem, the petals, um, it may be the leaves, it may be the roots. In all those cases, maybe the bark of a tree. And so in all those cases, those are composed of um, thousands of compounds. And what we're interested in is what's the actual active agent. In many cases, we're interested in what's the actual molecular target. Um, but we want to know what the active agent is. And also think about these. The compounds don't all come in the same concentration. Some are actually made in very small quantities as that plant grows um, and thrives um, naturally. In other cases, it may make um, quite a bit of a compound that might be of interest. So what we really want to do is take that compound, um, go through and 
like dried up leaves or stems or seeds or roots or whatever and see what kind of compounds we can actually extract chemically from them and try to understand if we can find out something that actually has biological activity. It may kill cells, it may kill organisms, something like that, and that might be useful. So we're going to do some type of isolation once we actually have um, the native uh, product um, around. We're going to try to purify it so we can purify it from being thousands of compounds, tens of thousands of compounds, into maybe a few hundred, and then see if within that pool of 100, there's some type of active agent. And within that, we can continue to purify it to be single compounds. And then we want to characterize what is that compound? Because that's something that we can think about taking into the lab and chemically modifying to maybe make it more effective in something that we're interested in. So we're going to take it once we characterize it, and we're going to try to optimize in terms of activity. So we'll simply change the molecule. The basic structure will be about the same, but we'll slightly modify it to see if we can change that. And then within all of that, then you have to move to trying to, to decide whether it's efficacious. And so what's going to be the potency of the compound? How long does it um, stay in terms of you know, dosing? Or is it metabolized very quickly? What's the stability? What's the safety? Is it toxic in some cases? What's the bioavailability in all cases? Is it something you're going to inject? Is it going to be something that you can take as a pill and so on? So you have to worry about those kind of things in terms of once you find a molecule, a chemical compound that really has some interest to it. And then you're ready to actually move into some type of trials. You can then test it with animal models to see whether it actually works um, in terms of efficacy. And then if that works in terms of thinking about um, whether or not it actually kills, say, bacteria, you're thinking about um, antibacterials, then you can move into clinical trials. And so you're going to try it with um, phase one in a very small population. Once you have that small population, it looks like it actually works. For the majority, it's not toxic, it's safe to use, and so on. Then you can go to a phase two trial. Within that, there'll be a larger population, so you'll see more in terms of the effects going to be, you have a wider range in terms of seeing what it's going to be available. And then you move into phase three and say phase four. So if you think about this process, taking something that looks like that we knew from history, um, basically a, a plant that um, had some type of nice biological activity we're interested in um, and moving it towards actually getting a drug that you want to develop, that's a process that's going to take at least a decade. It's going to take a long time to be able to go through those steps. So that's one reason when you talk about um, drug discovery, why it takes a long time typically to be able to do this, and also why it can be very expensive, because you're actually going to be looking at tens of thousands of compounds, hundreds of thousands of compounds, and you're going to be able to focus that down to one that's really going to be the effective one that's going to be useful, and then optimizing it in terms of um, activity. We go to the next slide. How prevalent is it in terms of thinking about natural products as sources of new drugs? And so um, decade by decade, um, two researchers, Newman and Craig, have gone through the literature and really studied where over-the-counter drugs have come from. And so this is a representation of roughly 40 years of looking at natural product discovery. And we see in those cases over 50% of drugs that actually come to market as over-the-counter drugs actually come from natural product sources. In some cases, they're very simple natural product sources. So that may be something that, um, that we really don't have to alter much for the molecule to make it effective. In some cases, you have to do extensive modification to make it useful in terms of trying to be a drug leading solution. So all of these different classes I've indicated the list kind of there are either some type of synthetic modification that was the S or S star um, that you may have um, a botanical. Um, that's going to be a mixture of compounds, not just a single compound. So that's NB that's listed there. Um, if it's unaltered, it's going to be the, the N, so about 4% come from there. And if you're thinking about um, natural product derivatives, that's going to be ND. So it's something that you actually have to modify quite a bit, 20% come from there. But still, it's an enormous amount over four decades where we really do find that nature does a very good job of coming up with molecules that are efficacious and interesting to us in terms of biological activity. So if you go to the last slide, um, I've just indicated in some cases for the Atkins garden, our typical interest has been focused on cancer and women's health, as Bethany's kind of outlined. But in fact, in all cases, you can see that um, we've had indications of um, useful natural products that have helped in terms of curing diphtheria or insulin or malaria. 
and then you continue to be um, useful in terms of deriving kind of new over counter drugs. Or if you think about um, infectious diseases, which this audience is kind of interested in, then in a number of cases as well, we can see smallpox, malaria, um, antimicrobials, black tea, green tea, which you've heard a lot, that can be efficacious. Those kind of things can be useful in terms of a set of molecules known as chemicals. So those actually can be um, helpful in terms of thinking about antimicrobial. Um, another thing, polio. And just recently, an article came out and it's highlighted, um, it's indicated on the, at least the Facebook page, um, a link to it in terms of looking at um, cannabinoids. Um, that was just recently published in the, in the lab that there's something that actually can come out of the cannabis sativa. And that can be useful in terms of looking at polio. And so, a number of cases, we continue to see nature doing just an amazing job of coming up with a, a repertoire of chemical compounds that are something more than what the chemists can do in terms of thinking about going to the lab and actually making things. So it really is a, a fruitful uh, exercise to think about continuing to look at that products as great source of food and drug discovery. All right, I think that ends it. Um, I think we'll have a closer slide. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, and we'll take any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, James, Bethany, uh, Bernie, uh, for great presentation. You guys provide a, a wide range of expertise, you know, and in, 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 in all of these areas. And I learned quite a bit, you know, just over the portion of the uh, program here. So greatly appreciate that. And as Bernie mentioned there at the end, if you're interested in asking any questions, any comments, uh, feel free to drop those down in the comment section. Um, I did put a link to uh, that URL there in the comments just now, um, linking to the YouTube channel for the Atkins Garden. If you'd like to learn more, that link that was in that um, uh, a final slide there, uh, learn more there. Um, and 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 I had a question to start off. You know, along those lines, um, if folks are, you know, I'm always interested in, you know, uh, more more resources, more sources. Um, and you mentioned it, you know, throughout each one of your portions of the presentation, you know, different sources or different uh, uh, things to, you know, things that you looked at. But for folks out there who may be interested in learning more, um, you know, whether it's along the lines of, you know, uh, James, you're talking about more of the historical uses, you know, in some of these previous um, epidemics and effects of these diseases or, um, you know, Bethany talking about, uh, you know, some of these uh, these plants um, and and how they've been used or, you know, uh, Bernie, if folks are interested in learning more about drug discovery and these natural products, do you guys have any recommendations on, you know, either good books or good websites or other resources uh, to point folks, um, you know, in a, in, in a direction to learn more after tonight's presentation? Well, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, from from the historical record, uh, especially of the eclectic Materia Medica, um, a lot of people, there, there's literature out there. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go to the Lloyd Library uh, website, you can actually find reprints of of the um, many of the uh, eclectic medical texts. Um, yeah, so sort of like probably more than 50 years worth of publications. And so that's where I got some of my, you know, some of the things that I presented those lists, right? Um, of course, that's that's not current, you know, like, so I'm not saying, but if you are interested, that's one place to look, uh, to study the eclectics. Um, there's some, there's a there's an author that, that studies the history of, of medicine, especially the, the eclectics. His name's John Haller. He has three or four. He has many. He's published many books. He's actually from. He's a, a emeritus professor at, at um, Southern Illinois University, and um, I can't think of the, the the names of his books. But if you if you Google John S. Haller, um, there there's some books that he wrote that goes into the great history of uh, of the of this kind of medicine. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to, to Bethany or Bernie if they have any other comments on that. I think the one thing I was going to add, um, we're all affiliates, so it's the farm, um, it's been newly, um, um, what do I say about the newly uh, uh, launched the Pharmacognosy Institute at UIC, 
Um, and within that, actually, if you check out the OIC website and, and look at the Pharmacognosis Institute, you'll see some of the research um, that actually talks a lot about um, the drug discovery process, kind of the extraction process, and the drug leads that include um, activities related to the Atkins Garden. So that actually might be a good source to, to look at some of the literature. And um, that, that Newman Craig um, article actually goes into details about um, drugs specifically like have been discovered for like cancer, for infectious diseases, and so on. So it's a nice way to kind of think about it. And again, just, um, we're in a climate now where we're probably hearing a lot about drug discovery because of COVID. And you hear a lot about what's clinical trials and getting the results out of clinical trials and so on. So this is kind of a um, kind of a recent but really interesting kind of uh, way to, to try to learn about some of this. So we're kind of living through uh, an epidemic right now, a pandemic right now. Yeah, for uh, for plant products, I think um, it's always good to try to stick with things from the United States Pharmacopeia. So the um, regulations on a lot of herbal supplements and botanicals can be a little bit um, hazy. So I think the the United States Pharmacopeia actually does research on a lot of these. So if you can find that seal on any kind of products that you're looking for, um, but as far as information, you could go to their website as well as Natural Medicines Database is another good one. I think, uh, yeah, I think the other thing is to mention is uh, both Bethany and James are um, associated with the Field Museum. And so again, if you're in Chicago, um, there is a display in terms of uh, uh, that's on natural products. And so um, that also would have some information there that might be interesting for a short afternoon tour. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for that. Thanks for all those great sources. Um, uh, and, you know, looking for more information. Um, uh, I had I, I had another question too. you know, a little bit, I guess, uh, more personal in in how, you know, I'm just curious how, how you all got uh, got into this line of work. You know, was this something that, you know, that you always wanted to do ever since you were a young kid or did you have, you know, a great experience one time? um you know from a family member or a friend and you're like man that sounds really cool something that i want to do or learn about it you know in your you know early school years or something but how did uh, each one of you get involved in 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 the work that each one of you are doing if you wouldn't mind sharing um i'll i'll, I'll make a comment uh my grandfather was a was a, a wonderful woodsman he loved to hunt and fish and and and, and those type of things and when i was about nine or 10 years old, I went deer hunting with them. And of course it's uh, the wintry time, you know, after Thanksgiving and there wasn't like, it wasn't frozen yet the ground, but we were walking through the dry woods, you know, everything was dead. Right. Apparently. And he saw a plant that he recognized based. I, I don't know how he recognized it. It might've been some, some seed pods or something on the plant. And he went and he pulled it out of the ground. And it was a little root on the bottom and he snapped it in two and he stuck it under my nose and he said, smell that. And, and I said, it smells like licorice, Grampy. <laughs> and he said, that's licorice root. And I was like, it blew my mind. It, it literally blew my mind, you know. And so um, that kind of got me started on, you know, basically edible plants and useful plants in the woods. And that was kind of my introduction to pharmacognosy, which I didn't know what... I didn't know anything about that at the time, but I eventually got into grad school. And like I said, the UIC has a world-class pharmacognosy program. There's very few of them in the United States. So that kind of brought me up to, to where we're at, you know, today. Very cool. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a similar, well, not a similar story. My grandfather, um, was a bacteriologist. So he actually worked for the NIH some a while ago and did some work with natural products, but he was he was a big proponent of, I guess, nutrition, just healing himself by what he ate. And he kind of instilled that in all of us. Um, and then after I finished my bachelor's degree, I spent some time in West Africa and I was just awesome. amazed by um, yeah, my friends that live there and how they would use plants for 
their medicines. So I, I wanted to learn more about it. Yeah, in my case, um, I'm a chemist um, by training and um, not interested in terms of drug discovery uh, very early on in terms of like graduate and postdoc um, research. And mostly was looking at molecular targets, trying to find molecules that would act as basically um, being able to develop drugs from scratch um, in terms of knowing what the targets were. And uh, we came to UIC, so we had such a great natural product program it just moves really well with being able to have um, a source. As I said, nature has been so clever in terms of developing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecules, um, more than what we can do in the lab. And so just being able to do that kind of development in terms of screening, um, this has been a great resource in terms of trying to come up with these new molecules and to think about drug discovery in a different way because um, typically it would take millions of dollars and it would take 20 years to develop a drug. And obviously, as we see, you can't wait that long for a number of these things, especially we're talking now about things like antibiotic resistance and so on, which happens over years. It's not happening over decades. So we're really concerned about it. just the process, what can we do better? Um, and all the pharmaceutical companies are really struggling with that. The biology is hard, the chemistry is really hard. And so um, it just this turns out to be just the right avenue different direction of working on that we really think uh, we can actually use now we can use genomics and other ways of actually taking plant genomes and trying to understand them and shuffling genomes so we can actually make new molecules that nature is really very good at doing. So it's just really a great time to you know, be involved in part of this area of research. Very cool. Well thank you all uh, for for sharing those sharing those stories. Uh, just always interested to see how folks get to where they are. Um, uh, so yeah, if you have any other questions, um, feel free to put those in the comments section. Uh, Barb uh, tuning in. Uh, Barb is our uh, Barb is our director, um, and I know she's she's from she's from Cincinnati. And I think James, you mentioned um, a place in Cincinnati that you recommended, and she was asking um, about that place one more time. Yes, um, so that's the Lloyd Library. Um, L L O Y D library and museum uh there were two brothers john yuri lloyd and i think was it yuri and john but they 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 came up in the classical eclectic golden age of pharmacy and so like i said the eclectic medical institute in cincinnati was where they taught and where they practiced um and then when basically at at the at the end of the sort of the so, well, sometime around getting toward the Second World War, when when chemical synthesized drugs really took off, um, these sort of magic bullets, as opposed to broad polypharmaceutical plant-based remedies, um, they kind of fell out of favor, and they were no longer, I guess, economically viable. So they they basically turned the Eclectic Medical Institute into the Lloyd Library and Museum. So yeah, it's. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. We're actually in the American Society of Pharmacognosy. We collaborate with the uh, with the uh, the Lloyd Library, and we're depositing, you know, a lot of correspondence of like some of our major professors and pharmacognosists of yore. Um, and what was I going to say? Well, the Lloyd Library is a wonderful resource. So if if you're ever in Cincinnati, please look it up. Uh, go there and. Um, it's yeah. I've, I actually I've never been there, <laughs> but I, and and I, I mentioned actually you can go onto their website, and you can find a lot of these old um, old literature based on you know I think thirty or forty years at least of publications um, from the Eclectic Medical Institute that talk about all kinds of illnesses and all kinds of treatments, all in the eclectic style of medicine, right? Mostly with plant based remedies. Yeah, so that's a, yeah, that's a really good resource for you guys, I think, for your upcoming exhibit. If you have a chance, kind of check those out a bit. Yeah, we'll certainly have to look into those. You know, I yeah, took down some some notes here, you know, as we were going along. So really appreciate that. Um, and uh, Barb also added that her her great grandfather was a compounding pharmacist in in Cincinnati, so that's why she was uh, she was interested. So appreciate that, James. Um, 
Yeah, not seeing um, uh, any other questions. You know, have some other folks. You know, I, I just want to. I just want to make a comment. Like in the Champagne area, I don't remember the name. It's in. I don't know if it's in the college. There's not a college of pharmacy. It, it's. I think it's somewhere in the university. There's a. There's a. There's a. A museum of. Um, of pharmacy. Somehow, and I, I. I wish I. I wish I had the the location of it. I. What I can do is maybe I can find it and send it to you, um, Pat. But it's basically they have um, a lot of old paraphernalia of that, you know, of that of that 19th century pharmacy, mm -hmm. real classical stuff. And there's actually a, um, it's the the books of the pharmacist. It's basically the the Abraham Lincoln's family. There's a whole a Lincoln. I don't know. There's some some stuff associated with um, with the Lincolns. And they're they're the use of drugs that they that they utilize and stuff. So um, I, I can't remember exactly where it is, but it's in your area, and and you guys should maybe check that out as well. I'll I'll try to find uh, the, the link to it or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah but, I think that's another good resource for you guys. I've done some. I've done some. Uh, uh, I've been in correspondence, and I made a visit to uh, the Pearson Museum. It's in Springfield um, through the. Uh, SIU medical school there. Um, and they had, I'm not sure if that's the resource or maybe there's another one, but that, uh, yeah, I'll that might be it. it. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah. yeah. They, it was a really cool it, place. It might be an SIU. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think the one I'm thinking of is in Champaign because they had the Lincoln, the sure. Lincoln medicine book. Well, yeah. yeah. So I'm, but okay. yeah, I'll see if I can find that for you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I'll have to look into that too. Bernie or Bethany, were you going to say something as well? I'm sorry. I thought it might be the Spurlock Museum. Spurlock Museum, yeah, um, uh, old uh, old name, the World Heritage Museum as well. Um, I'll have to, uh, and I know our, our director Barb um, worked there, and and we do some work with them. So yeah, I'll have to reach out to them too, and in, uh, in uh, working with them going forward, yeah, Spurlock Museum. Make a note of that as well. Um, okay. Um, yeah, we're just you know I'm not seeing many questions come in. Uh, I have some folks saying thank you. Um, Susan says, thank you. Tuning in from Michigan. Thanks for tuning in tonight, Susan. Um, and tuning in says, thank you as well. Uh, Barb also says she loves the licorice story um, uh, that uh, that you shared, James. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, and uh, yeah, that seems to be uh, the uh, the end of, of comments or questions coming in. So I just wanted to extend another thank you uh, to you, James, Bethany, and Bernie for joining us tonight. Thanks to everybody for uh, tuning in for this presentation. I appreciate all the work that went into um, uh, this presentation tonight and uh, all the work that you all continue to do. And as they mentioned, and I dropped those uh, links earlier into the chat here, into the comments section, uh, learn more about the Atkins uh, um, uh, Medicinal Plant Garden up at the University of Illinois Chicago. Check out those links. Check out their website. Visit them if you're in the area sometime. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to see if I can make a stop by uh, when I'm in the Chicago area next time because uh, it, it does seem like a, a nice little uh, escape from the hustle and bustle of the big city, which seems uh, 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 quite interesting to check out. So really appreciate that. And uh, I'm uh, just putting in one last thing into the comments section, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program. Um, we'd, we'd appreciate it if you took a short survey letting us know what you thought about tonight's program, as well as if you have any other suggestions for future programming. So uh, for James, for Bethany, for Bernie, um, I want to say thank you all, um, and we'll see you at our next presentation. Take it thank easy. you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.